everyone, welcome back. So today we're going to be talking about a concept in machine learning that doesn't get a lot of love called hyperparameter tuning. Now, it also is often misunderstood, so I'm hoping to clear up some of those confusions here. But first, we have to kind of talk about what a hyperparameter is and why we want to tune them. The easiest way is to look at a concrete model. So let's look at a decision tree. It's something that we learned pretty early on, easy to understand. Now, at a very simple level, we think of a decision tree or any machine learning model really as just some input output machine where we feed our features in and we get some kind of label, whether it's a regression problem or a binary classification, whatever it is, we get some kind of answer to our question. Now, if we think a little bit deeper, we actually have more control over how these machines work than you might first expect. For example, with a decision tree, we're going to talk about two hyperparameters today, but there's many more and every model has its own set of possible hyperparameters. The first hyperparameter we'll talk about is called the maximum depth of the tree. Why does this matter? Well, if we didn't specify how deep the tree is allowed to get, it would just get arbitrarily deep. It would keep learning more and more and more things about the training data. But the problem is at some point during the growth of the tree, we go from learning important, valuable things about the training data to just learning noise. And now we're in this kind of bad territory of overfitting. So it's important to tune this hyperparameter called depth so that we get a tree that is learning enough, but not learning too much. And so to be very explicit for a second, this depth is a hyperparameter because it has nothing to do with the features we're feeding in. It has nothing to do with the labels that are coming out. It's truly just informing how this machine that we're using to answer the problem is going to work behind the scenes. Another such hyperparameter is maximum number of features that you're allowed to consider at each of these internal nodes. So to go to a little bit deeper into how decision trees work for a moment. At each of these internal nodes, you're basically picking which of the features out of all the features you have is going to be the most valuable to split on at this moment in time. And if we don't specify this hyperparameter, then it has all of the features available to it at every single internal node. Now this might seem like a great thing. Why would we not want to include all the features at our disposal? But we run into the same problem as with this depth hyperparameter, where we might build a model that is too in tune with the training data because the training data might have some values for a couple of the features that are not really generalizable, that are not good if we keep locking onto those. And so by limiting the maximum number of features at each internal node, saying that actually you only have access to half of all the features at each internal node, then that might help to build a more generalizable model. So if this sounds like different versions of the bias variance trade-off, that's exactly what's going on. Most hyperparameters in my experience can be explained in terms of the bias variance trade-off where we want to build a model that is smart, but not too smart, where it's not reading too much into the training data leading to overfitting. So these are just the two we'll be talking about. Now that we understand what a hyperparameter is and why it's important to tune it, how do we actually do this? The most brute force, the most easy way to understand is called grid search. So we pick some possible candidates for maximum depth. Here we're choosing either two, three, four, or five. And we pick some possible candidates for maximum number of features again, two, three, four, or five. And we just try every combination of these two hyperparameters. Or if you have more hyperparameters, you'll just choose every possible combination of them. You'll build a model on your training data with that set of hyperparameters. And then you'll calculate your performance metric. For example, we'll keep it simple and just say it's accuracy today. And so that's exactly what you're seeing here in these results. So these red numbers here are the accuracies for each combination of hyperparameters. And you see that the winner is going to be this guy right here. And you see we have a maximum accuracy of 90% when both maximum depth and maximum number of features is 3 and 3. So that seems fine. We only had to train 16 models in the process. So you see there's four numbers here and four numbers here. So 4 times 4 gives you 16 decision trees you have to train. And since decision trees generally train fairly fast. This doesn't seem like a big problem. Why would we not just do this? Well, you might have already seen this coming, but when we're dealing with machine learning problems, we often have very big data. So let's look at what can happen in even a modest situation. So this is a complete method. You're going to go over all these different uh, combinations of hyperparameters, but it can get really costly. So imagine that you have H hyperparameters. Here we just had two, but in general you could have like five, ten, even more sometimes. And let's say that you're going to give L levels to each hyperparameter. So here we gave four levels to each hyperparameter, but in general you could have arbitrarily many levels for each hyperparameter to take. And let's say that one model takes you M minutes to train. With decision trees it could be fast, but if you are training random forests or neural networks instead, now each model takes a serious amount of time to train. So you really have to think about how long this is going to take. 
So what's the total amount of time to run this whole grid search? Well, it's going to be L to the power of H times M. This first part here, L to the power of H, is just saying that each of the hyperparameters has L levels. So it's L times L times LH times. And then for each of those, we have to train a model, which is going to take on average M minutes. So that's why you have L to the power of H times M. Let's put in some real numbers. Let's say we have five hyperparameters, 10 levels each, and each model just takes one minute to train. The total amount of time, if you multiply that out, is going to be seven days worth of computing time. So you're sitting there waiting a week to get the results. And let's say you figure out in the middle of that you made some kind of mistake, boom, got to start over. So this is obviously not the best way to go about hyperparameter tuning. And so let's talk about a smarter method. And that also allows us to bring in some different places of stats, specifically Bayesian statistics. So generally a smarter way to do hyperparameter tuning is with a Bayesian search. So it's actually pretty intuitive. I actually have a, a visual here. Let's fill it in and think about how Bayesian hyperparameter tuning might work. Let's just say we have two hyperparameters again, but all this is going to extend. So we have H1, which is the first hyperparameter on the x-axis, and H2, which is the second hyperparameter on the y-axis. And let's say that we have some kind of prior belief on which hyperparameters are most likely to lead to high accuracies. And let's say that's generally this region here. So that might come from some research papers we've read or some past experiments that we've run. But we're just going to say that I think the possibly best combination of hyperparameters is in that area there. This green star represents the actual true best in this case. So you might be kind of alarm bells going off in your head because you're saying, oh, this region that I think is going to be great actually doesn't have the answer to the question. But you'll see how this all self-corrects. And so Bayesian hyperparameter tuning basically starts by saying that I'm going to give a higher probability of sampling some combination of hyperparameters from this prior belief space here. But that doesn't mean that everything else has a zero probability. All the space that's not in this area here still has some positive probability. So I might still choose that every once in a while. And then it just proceeds like this. For the first combination of hyperparameters, we basically just sample from this entire hyperparameter space weighted by the probability of our prior belief. So let's say our first hyperparameter combination comes from here because that's currently the most likely area for us to sample. And then we calculate the accuracy there and find out, oh, not super high. And then after learning that it's not super high there, we actually downweight that area. So maybe just this local area around here by a little bit. We say that, you know, previously I thought that was going to be a good move, but it didn't turn out to be that great. So I'm going to bring down the probability of sampling from there in the future by a little bit. Next, we sample from here maybe, and we find the same information. Mm, not looking too good. Let's downweight the probability there a little bit too. And so we are doing this very cool, interesting thing of learning from the past history of our experiments. Because although we had this prior belief, it's not really panning out in this situation. And you see that as we sample more and more and more from this space, and we find that it's not really good, we're going to be downweighting this entire area, which is going to relatively upweight everything that is not in that area. And let's say when we start sampling from these, as they get relatively higher and higher and higher probabilities of being chosen, we do find they're doing really well, which causes us to upweight all those things. And you see in this process, we efficiently and rather quickly lock on to this correct combination of hyperparameters that's going to give us the best accuracy. So that's the beauty of Bayesian stats. I'm just blown away by it every time, even though I've looked at this many, many times, but super cool. And you can see intuitively why this is better than a grid search. A grid search is just going through every possible combination, not learning anything from the past. A Bayesian search is saying that I have some kind of prior belief. Let's do some experiments. Let's learn from those experiments and find the best combination of hyperparameters. And so the advantages are everything I just talked about. Uh, if I had to talk about the disadvantages, we may not find the absolute best one. So a grid search is guaranteed to find you the best. It's just that it could take forever. A uh, Bayesian search might find you a very nice approximate solution in a very small amount of time. So I think it's usually a trade-off that's worth making. Uh, the other thing with a Bayesian search is your prior might have a big impact. Like we thought this was the best area and it could take us a while to realize that it's not. Um, but you can always just set a flat prior where you don't have any information that you're going off of and you just use the experimental history by itself. So these are the considerations there. And the last thing I'll talk about in this video is what should you expect from hyperparameter tuning in general? Is this usually a step in the machine learning pipeline that's going to give you huge gains? Is this the make or break between a poor model and a good model? In my experience, generally, no. Uh, in my experience, hyperparameter tuning usually gives 
marginal gains in performance. Now, obviously, I've put the usually word in red underline because there's always going to be different cases based on your project. But personally, I found in most machine learning projects I've worked on, the big make or breaks are usually going to be which features you use and how important they are and which model you select versus other models. Hyperparameter tuning will give you a little bit of gain here and there. There's going to be some non-ignorable marginal gains that you're going to get, but they're going to be just that, marginal. It's usually going to be more preferable if you spend a lot of time uh, engineering new features, trying to pull in new data sources that's going to give you more gain in your final model. Hyperparameter tuning is just kind of a layer you add at the very end to kind of get that boom, extra jump that you need to get to that best possible model. So hopefully you learned about hyperparameter tuning in this video. If you have any questions, please leave them in the comments below. Thanks for watching, like and subscribe, and I'll see you next time.